Hello everybody and welcome back to another exciting edition of Biographic, the show where I, Matt, the Game Boy, will take you through the highs and lows of the original Game Boy library, one cart at a time. This week, we're looking at a Japanese oddity called Vanishing Racer. Language is a funny thing. Despite how well we can often communicate with one another, there are just some words that have no literal translation into English, like hygge or letost. If you add on top of this cultural differences and reference points, language can become a minefield of misunderstanding. Of course, in the realms of video games, we often rely on a publisher and localization team to translate titles, character names, and to unpack cultural references in a manner we can understand. But when a game doesn't see an official release in the West, it's up to the fan translators who step in to make these games accessible to an English-speaking audience. Sometimes, of course, when a game's title gets a fan translation, years later the publisher themselves might come along and retcon that. Case in point, Kairo no Tami ni Kani wa Naru, which, after years of being translated in various ways, Mashuro Sakurai, director of the Smash Brothers series, called the game The Frog for Whom the Bell Tolls, and, well, gave the game an official English title. Jalico's 1991 Banishing Racer, however, is one game that has never been retconned. I myself have called this game by that name for many years on my quest to own a copy of it. However, while doing my research on the game for this very video, I realised I've probably been saying it wrong all along. My reasoning? Well, this post on the VG Junk review of the game by a user called Parsley Boots, who correctly points out Japan's habit of using the word vanishing in the title of their car movies, probably after the movie Vanishing Point. The original Gone in 60 Seconds became Vanishing in 60, while Army of One became, you guessed it, Vanishing Red. The reason for the potential mix-up here is the katakana used in the game's title, Ba. Usually, as one would expect, it's pronounced Ba, but sometimes due to the lack of katakana, to transcribe English words starting with a V sound, it's pronounced Va. With Jalico dissolving in 2014, we may never know which of these titles was correct. But with the language lesson done, I'm siding with the logic of vanishing over banishing, as, well, neither of them really makes sense. You see, the racer mentioned in the title is neither banishing or vanishing. In fact, he's not even really racing, but platforming. The game opens showing our courageous coupe down on his luck in a scrap heap, wheelless, friendless, and without a hope of living life on the road. After wishing on a star, however, a goddess comes down to earth to restore him to his former four-wheeled glory, and sends him out for one last ride. But Matt, I hear you cry, cars can't jump! Well, don't worry dear viewer, neither really can the ones in the game. Well, maybe that's a little bit below the fan belt. What I mean to say is, they don't jump in a nice feeling way. The game's development team over at Jalico obviously intended to make the car in the game handle how you'd expect a jumping car to, slow and with a real heft to it. While this approach to platforming feels unique, it right out of the gate feels incredibly cumbersome to play, and I could honestly tell that it was going to be trouble later on if things got too hectic. Another odd thing about how the game handles is there's no turning around in Vanishing Racer. Yep, just like a real car, your motor only goes in forward and reverse, meaning backing away from your enemies is a little slower than you probably like. Fortunately, these are the only real things the game plays with in terms of the platforming formula, meaning once you get used to them, you're in for somewhat of an easy ride. Well, that is to say where the controls are concerned. The game is of course populated by enemy vehicles, who, like our jolly jalopy, are all rocking a pair of anthropomorphic eyes. There are fiendish photos, loutish lorries, and even diabolical bombers for you to overcome on the game's 15 stages. But you know where there's also a lot of... Shameless breaches of copyright. Yep, after the second stage, the game's developers get tired of simply taking inspiration from the female cowgirl on Las Vegas's Glitter Gulch Casino and move into straight-up parody mode. There's Donkey Kong, Pac-Man, even the Ninja Turtles make an appearance in this quirky little platformer as things you need to park yourself on the head of, making me think I know why this game never saw a Western release. But the weirdest doesn't stop there. Each of the game's five stages, spanning the breadth of the US, are split up into three levels apiece. The first and third levels are always platforming stages, 
But on the second stage, well, they see a car grow wings or turn into a submarine. Yes! Not since James Bond will you have witnessed a car with so many tricks up his sleeve. A truly altering vehicle unfortunately doesn't turn these auto-scrolling stages into side-scrolling shooters you might expect, as enemies still need to be killed with bops on the head. But hey, we can dream. Oddly, these auto-scrolling levels themselves are inconsistent in their design. Some of them are, as mentioned, the flying and swimming stages. But Stage 2 doesn't have an auto-scrolling level at all. Instead, it makes you platform a relatively straightforward course of rising and falling platforms. While the fifth stage moves its auto-scrolling section to the end in what is possibly the biggest spike in difficulty I've ever seen in a game. It really does employ a lot of really nasty tricks the player isn't expecting, like tight timing windows to get around corners filled with a variety of enemies, small raises in the terrain to catch a player out, and well, some flat out tricky jumps. This wouldn't be so bad if Vanishing Racer's Infinite Continues saw you starting again on the stage you died on, but as you go right back to the first level of the stage, it can get frustrating, especially where the bosses are concerned. You see, after every odd stage, you'll fight a boss encounter. These bosses themselves are pretty straightforward. There's a kaiju-esque lizard creature who breathes fire, a bulldozer, and then a tank driven by what I can only describe as a beaked monkey. There's a real attempt by the designers to incorporate jump mechanics into these boss fights, but with the limitations in speed and how our four-wheeled friend handles in the air, it really means you're going to find yourself dying a lot to these fiendish foes. It's these inconsistencies with how the game handles, its difficulty spikes and general lack of regard for the player that, if I'm being totally honest, lead me to say that Vanishing Racer at its best is a competent, fun experience, but at its worst and more consistently is a badly designed game. The reliance on odd car-based physics aside, the designers often use established mechanics against the player and really slow the gameplay down. There is a consistent use of tight corridors with spikes on the top of them, with large swaths of enemies, that if you mess up the jump timing, will see your little broom broom that could impaled and right back at the beginning of the level. There are a ton of segments with moving platforms that are, in my eye, only possible to beat after repeat playthroughs of a level. This rinse and repeat gameplay would be fine if, again, it wasn't so inconsistent. Some levels are a complete doddle, while in the very next stage, you might need a master boost jumping in a way the game hasn't required the player to do before, before turning to a relatively straightforward experience in the very next level. There are also enemies in play that appear once in the entire game, which from an aesthetic perspective is great, but from a gameplay point of view, they're just tediously placed to kill the player by catching them off guard. That is of course when you see them at all, and they don't spawn in to gang rush you. There's also the confusing time mechanic to deal with, because it isn't a countdown clock, but a multiplier for the player's score, meaning you'll want to try and go fast, despite, as I've mentioned, the game's level design slowing you down completely in some spots. There's also hidden platforms that lead to extra lives around the stages that should be a fun to find bonus, but are generally placed in places the player will jump in order to reveal them. The only issue is the only real reason the player has to jump in the first place is to avoid projectiles, and well, that means you end up getting killed by an act of kindness. While I'm telling you that Vanishing Racer is really not a well-designed game, I cannot argue that from an aesthetic standpoint, the game is in the higher tier on the platform. Visually and musically, Vanishing Racer is just top-notch. I'd find myself clicking pause when I got frustrated with the level, and just taking a moment to listen to the music while admiring the graphics, something I very rarely do these days. The game's incredibly small development team, Shoji Takashita on design, and director Tomoji Otomari on graphics, Yasuyuki Suzuki scoring the work, and Yasuo Ikagura doing the programming, all push the game in interesting ways. But it's truly Suzuki and Omatani's contributions that really shine through here, as you'd expect from the top-notch work on the other Jalico titles of the day. None of these creators incidentally worked on Jalico's other car-based pseudo-platformer City Connection though, hence why I felt it unnecessary to connect the two games in this review. Unfortunately, as I mentioned right up top, the game only came out in Japan, and now demands a simply dazzling amount because the internet has designated it as a rare game. Please, 
don't buy this game for silly money, as I honestly can't recommend it for more than the music and visuals, all of which can be enjoyed by watching a Let's Play. Retrobit was supposed to release the game as part of a Jalico game cart announced in 2017, but based on the lack of information since the announcement, and the company's reply to my tweet asking about its status, I don't think that's happening anytime soon. Vanishing Racer is certainly a delight of the senses, but from a gameplay perspective, I really would steer clear of this game, unless you're lucky enough to find it cheap like I did. The game's high prices have made it appear to be some kind of supercart, but I'm afraid to say this game's attractive box art and the perception of its rarity have made people confuse this Fiesta with a Ferrari. If you're in doubt, take it for a spin and let me know what you think. Ah, that brings us to the end of another episode of Biography, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed. If you have, let me know in the comments down below, and look out for a July license video coming at the end of this week. But until then, game boys and girls, be sure to game on. <laughs>